chapter 2, verses 7 to 9. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the hills and, and build a house, that I may take pleasure in it, and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. He's talking about the, the call to rebuild the temple. Chapter 2, verses 7 to 9. And I will shake all nations, so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Two pictures there. One is of the, of the physical rebuilding of the temple. The other is of what God will do in it and through it. And it's interesting. As great as the first temple was, he says the glory of this one will be greater than the first. And of course the ultimate glory of the temple is the Lord Jesus Christ coming to be our Messiah. And then the Spirit coming and dwelling in us to make us temples of the Holy Spirit. We've read together what? The inerrant infallible all-sufficient word of god let's watch this video and learn and then we'll do our own little study off of this after that the book of the prophet haggai it's one of the smaller prophetic books but crucially important in the overall story of the hebrew bible so for centuries, the Hebrew prophets had been accusing Israel of breaking their covenant with God through idolatry and injustice, and they warned that God would send the great empire of Babylon to take out Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and haul off the people into exile. And it all happened in the year 587 BC. But that wasn't the end of the story. The prophets also believed that there was still hope, and that God would one day bring back a transformed remnant of his people Israel to live in a new Jerusalem, where God's presence would live in their midst. Now when we turn to Haggai, the year is 520 BC, nearly 70 years after the exile. And the Babylonian Empire has recently collapsed, and the world is now ruled by the Persians. Now they allowed the return of any exiled Israelites who wanted to go back to Jerusalem, which still lay in ruins. And so under the leadership of a high priest named Joshua, and Zerubbabel, an heir from the line of David, and a group of exiles, they all returned and began to rebuild the city and their lives. Remember the story from the book of Ezra, chapters 1 to 6. So our hopes are high, and the future seems very bright, but it's not, actually, at least from Haggai's point of view. The book consists of four sections that summarize Haggai's message given to the people of Jerusalem over the course of four months. He opens by accusing the people of misplaced priorities. And so, yes, they have come back to Jerusalem, but they're spending all of their time and resources rebuilding their own fancy houses, while the temple still lay in ruins from its destruction from 70 years ago. So Haggai asks, are your own houses really more important than your allegiance to God? This neglect, Haggai says, is tantamount to the covenant rebellion of their ancestors, which is why the land is still unproductive, why they've been struck with famine and drought. And here Haggai's quoting from the list of covenant curses in the book of Deuteronomy. And so Haggai's challenging words, they're followed by a story of the people's response. Remember also the story in Ezra chapter 5. We're told that Zerubbabel, Joshua, the remnant of the people, were provoked by Haggai's message, and they were motivated. They started rebuilding the temple. So in the next section, Haggai follows up one month later, and he addresses some problems of shattered expectations among the people. So the temple that they're rebuilding is really pretty unimpressive. It's nothing compared to the glory of the temple Solomon built here some 500 years earlier. And so morale was really low for finishing the project. And so Haggai reminds the people of the great prophetic promises of the future kingdom of God and about this temple. He draws from the earlier prophets, especially Isaiah and Micah, about the new Jerusalem and that it would be the place from which God would redeem the whole world and where all nations would come and participate in God's kingdom, resulting in an era of peace. And so the temple, it plays a key role in God's plans for the future. And Haggai calls on the people to work in hope despite the disappointing circumstances. In the third section, Haggai follows up two months later with a call to covenant faithfulness. And he engages some priests in a conversation about ritual purity. Remember all the key ideas from the book of Leviticus. So he says, if someone goes and touches a dead body and becomes ritually impure or marked by death, 
And then they go and touch some food. Is that food impure too? And the priests, knowing the book of Leviticus, say, yes, it's impure. And then Haggai turns this into a parable. He says, this is how it is with the people of Israel and what they're putting their hands to in rebuilding the temple. If the current generation doesn't humble themselves, if they don't turn from injustice and apathy, then Haggai says whatever they build with their hands, including this new temple, will be impure too. Haggai's challenge is that it's only by true repentance and covenant faithfulness that their building efforts will result in God bringing his kingdom and blessing. And so, in a sense, Israel's future lay in their hands. God's waiting for his people to be faithful. And so the choice that Haggai's laying before the exiled generation, it's very similar to the challenge Moses gave the wilderness generation before entering the land. Their obedience will lead to blessing and success, while faithlessness will lead to ruin. The book concludes with Haggai's summary of the future hope of God's kingdom. He's going to make the new Jerusalem the center of his glorious international kingdom. And from there, he will confront and defeat evil among the nations. He reminds people of the defeat of Pharaoh's army in the Exodus story. God will fulfill here his promise to David and establish the king from his line. And in Haggai's day, that was represented by Zerubbabel. And so the book ends with the choice of a bright future just hanging there. So the question is, will Haggai's generation be faithful to God? Will they experience the fulfillment of all these promises? And Zerubbabel, will he be faithful? Will he turn out to be the messianic king? And you have to just keep reading into the final two books of the prophet, Zechariah and Malachi, to find out. But you can see how this little book contains a great challenge to every generation of God's people, that our choices really matter, and that the faithfulness and obedience of God's people is part of how God has chosen to work out his purposes in the world. And so this surprising truth should motivate humility and action in God's people as they look forward to God's coming kingdom. And that is the message of the book of Haggai. Effective summary. So if it would remind you that the theme, I hope you don't get tired of hearing this, but I want to keep this in context. What got us started on this journey is Jesus' statement in John 5, 39 to 40 to the leaders, the Jewish leaders, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness of me. <clears throat> we only understand the scriptures properly when we see them through the lenses of God's story unfolding about his Messiah. Jesus says, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. And I would submit to you that it doesn't matter what kind of a biblical scholar a person is, if he or she misses Jesus, they completely miss the scriptures. They won't understand. So look at a summary of, uh, of Haggai. The Babylonian exile is history. It took place in 586. You heard our video say 587. When you study uh, people, historians on this, you'll pick up a 586 slash 587, 587, 586 BC. Uh, when the Jews return to the land. When they get back, the work of, of building the temple begins. Uh, but 16 years after the process has begun, uh, the people have not finished it. Uh, they've let other things, and you heard one of them was their, their repair of their own houses took precedent over the repair of the temple. Interfered with, and, and God's directive was to go back and rebuild the temple. So Haggai unloads several fiery sermons, or what one writer said, sermonettes. They're small but, but poignant and they're designed to, to provoke the nation uh, out of their lethargy, out of their distractions, out of, out of a wrong sense of, of priorities. He calls the builders to renew their courage in the Lord, to a renewed holiness of life and a renewed faith in God who controls the future. When you look at a, at a sketch, sort of an outline sketch of Haggai, here's what you see. The date of it goes from September 1st, 520 B.C. through December 24th, 520 B.C. So it's a really short uh, amount of time, just a few months. 
And you break it down into the following headings. Completion of the, of the latter temple, chapter 1, verses 1 to 15, where, uh, where the Lord says, Consider your ways, my house that is in ruins. So it's a rebuke takes place. The second movement in this is, uh, concerns the glory of the latter temple. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater, God said. We read that earlier. And so there becomes an encouragement to them. The first was a rebuke. Now it's an encouragement for what's coming. Then third is the present blessing of obedience. It's a theme we've seen over and over and over. And we read it through New Covenant lenses and realize that, you, that you're not saved by your good works, but salvation by grace through faith comes to us, Ephesians 2.10, in order that we may do good works. There's a, there's, there's a connection there. Uh, so this present blessing of obedience, the Lord says, from this day forward I will bless you. And then the future blessing through, that comes through promise in those last few verses, I will shake heaven and earth. So Haggai is, is second only to Obadiah in his brevity among the Old Testament books. So o, only Obadiah is smart, is shorter than Haggai. But in these few verses, there's some four terse sermons. And they accomplish the intended effect. It is to, to provoke them out of their lethargy. And, and the good news is people respond. It, again, it puts Haggai in a very different category. Think of all the prophets we've studied and how they preached their hearts out and pled with the people and warning. And they basically yawned at them. The only exception being, of course, Jonah, who didn't want to see good things happen. Well, Haggai comes in with these strong messages and the people respond they heard him he's he's kind of set apart uh, in the prophets uh, the work on the temple has stopped the people are distracted and they're an off task from what god sent them back to do so god does not bless their labors and there's a there's a principle there he who honors me i will honor God said years ago in the days of Saul and David. He who despises me, I will lightly esteem. So God doesn't bless their labors. And only when the people repent and, and bear fruit of repentance do we see the Lord begin to bless. His hand of blessing is once again on them. So Haggai becomes, in this prophetic scenario, uh, God's man in God's hour to call the people to do God's work. When you look at this first section, the completion of the, of the latter temple, chapter 1, verses 1 to 15, the remnant returns under Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is, is from the line of David, so you have something very significant. The priest is, is Joshua, uh, not, not Joshua of the, uh, of the Exodus but someone named Joshua. And uh, remember, so this priest stands, his name means, it's Yahashua, God is my salvation. And Zerubbabel, who is a descendant of David, you have a priest and a king standing here to lead the people to begin to rebuild the temple. Uh, but if you look at chapter 1, verse 4, uh, they build for themselves what was called uh, paneled houses or, uh, in other words, nice, nice houses. And then they claim that the time for building the temple has not yet come. So God communicates with the remnant. And the people respond. 23 days later now, if you're getting the sequence here, they again begin to work on the temple. So, so when Haggai brings this first message, within three weeks, he gets, he gets a good, positive response. The second movement in this prophecy is the glory of the latter temple. They're, they've taken, undertaken the mission, but they begin to be discouraged. And you heard on the video, because the temple they're building is nothing like the temple that was destroyed. 
And what they're going to have to learn from this is that the latter glory of the temple will not be in the building, but in the dwelling of God. That's where they learn to look. And so as the elders remember the glory of Solomon's temple, they begin to complain about what, what's being put in its place. And so Haggai begins to remind them of God's promises. And appreciate this. This, this is a people at this point very fixed on, on physical location. They're being weaned from this to learn that, that God does not dwell in buildings, that you must, you must seek him for his, his majesty and will learn then that, that we become. Uh, Paul says in the New Testament, uh, in Colossians, Christ in you. And if you, read, if you read the language there, it's Christ in the midst of you. Not, it's, in, in Colossians, it's not Christ in you and Christ in you. It's Christ in the midst of you is the hope of glory. And so they begin to be weaned to view God in a more spiritual, uh, near, if you, if you understand the words, uh, transcendent and imminent. The transcendence of God speaks of his, his, his sovereign majesty that is unparalleled, it's comprehensive. His imminence speaks of his drawing near to them. And they're going to have to learn to see him both ways. Then there's the future blessings. Uh, when he addresses the priests, uh, he gives a second message to Zerubbabel himself, who's a governor. Zerubbabel's role, by the way, is that of a governor. He's been seized under the authority uh, of the foreign power. God will move in judgment. His power, by his power, he will overthrow the nations of the earth, which is good news. And Zerubbabel, we'll see in a few minutes, it becomes a symbol uh, of the Messiah, the coming Messiah. Zerubbabel will be honored. What is Zerubbabel? He's the son of David. And so there was this promise that, that, that the son of David will sit on David's throne. Well, as far as the, as the, uh, the title of the prophecy, we mentioned this a little bit last week too. God raises up this, this one uh, and if you looked at his, his name in the, in the Hebrew, it would, it would be uh, Haggai. There's some speculation as to where that comes from. What's the derivative? Perhaps some have offered from the Hebrew word Hag, which means festival. It may also be an abbreviated form of Hagia. And Hagia is, is the festival of Yahweh. So they conclude from this that, that his name, Haggai, means festal or festive. One possibility that's been posited is that he may have been born on the day of, of one of the major feasts. And so that would be the name that his parents would give, such as the Feast of Tabernacles, perhaps. Uh, it's pointed out that in Haggai 2.1 that his second sermon takes place during the Feast of Tabernacles. You wouldn't pick this up unless you knew the chronology here. When, when in Hebrews they start talking about in this particular month, and this, they're citing festival chronology. Haggai 2, 1, in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, why would they say that? Because that is the day of the, of the Feast of Tabernacles. You go read your Old Testament Levitical Code and Deuteronomic, Deuteronomic Code, and you'll see that those days are spelled out for that. The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Who's the author? Well, we know his name is mentioned nine times in the prophecy itself. Uh, so it's really interesting. You know, we've talked to you as we've gone through these 30-something books that, that some people say well, liberals usually challenge the authorship of this or the authorship of that. Haggai is different. It, his authorship is virtually uncontested, no matter where you find yourself in the spectrum of theological discussion. There's a unity of it, of the theme. There's a unity of the style. Uh, he, he gives us the dates himself. But he's only known from what is said in this book and then two references I want to call your attention to in Ezra. Ezra chapter 5, verse 1. Now the prophets, 
Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So you see this reference uh, in, in Ezra chapter 5. In chapter 6, verse 14, And the elders of the Jews built and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. They finished their building by the decree of the God of Israel and by the decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. So you see in, in the Ezra historical material that Haggai was laboring uh, alongside a younger prophet, Zechariah. We're going to see this next week. Encouraging the rebuilding of the temple. And some think, and I don't, I don't, this is just conjecture. Haggai 2, verse 3, uh, wonder if he was born in Judah before the 586 uh, B.C. deportation. Look at chapter 2, verse 3. Who is left among you? who saw this house in its former glory. How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Talking about the contrast after the destruction of it. So perhaps he was in, this, in the captivity, the cluster that was taken captive. A small number of those who could remember the, the former temple before its destruction. Others suppose he may have been born in Babylon during captivity. If he was born before, he'd put him about 75 years old when he, when he preached these messages. So let's get our chronology right. In 538 B.C., Cyrus of Persia issued a decree allowing the Jews to return to their land and rebuild the temple. The first return was led by Zerubbabel, and in 536 B.C., work on the temple began. So... 586, 536, 50 years later, they return and begin the work. And you can read uh, some background in this, Ezra chapters 4 through 6, if you want to. And you'll, you'll read there, you remember how the Samaritans hindered the building of the temple. They wrote a letter to the Persian king protesting it. Uh, and the remnant began to be discouraged because there were so many challenges to the task they wanted to accomplish. So their optimism when they first were released from captivity to return to their homeland uh, turns into desolation because what they faced there, uh, the land was fallow, crops failed, it was very hard work to survive, there was a lot of hostility they faced, other hardships. So it wasn't the great parade back home that they thought it would be. And they're not, they're not really unlike the Jews who leave Egypt uh, in the Exodus, who are thrilled to leave, but then the more they journey, or in this, place, in this case, the more they labor to restore, the more they realize they gave up, though they were slaves in captivity, they gave up relative comfort in, in Babylon uh, to take on quite a project. And so in 534, so the decree goes out in 538, they're released in 536. In 534, rather than fight the opposition around them, uh, work ceases on the temple. Their discouragement leads to spiritual lethargy. They became preoccupied with their own concerns. There's a pattern here, folks. You, you, you read about this, you see... That could happen today. There's a zeal about the possibilities of what God can do. And you enter into that, and instead of, instead of great possibilities and fruit and reward and blessing, you encounter hardship and, and uh, pushback. That's true of every generation. So they turn to bless themselves. If they're not going to have the blessing of God upon their labor, they turn to bless themselves. And so you, you'll read that they began to, to muse, perhaps, perhaps our building of the temple is premature. Maybe we need to tackle this later. We need to get 
get a firm foundation first for ourselves. Perhaps after we rebuild Jerusalem, then we'll put the, put the gemstone, the capstone, in by rebuilding the temple. So these were the excuses for neglecting the work that God had called them to do. So God calls up Haggai and then a contemporary, Zechariah, we'll see him next week, to urging the people to complete the temple. And so I want to show you just some dating that, that makes these two books really unusual. Haggai 1.1 tells us that this happened September 1st, 520 B.C. Haggai 1.15 talks about it being September 24th, 520 B.C. You can check these out in the... Haggai 2.1 is dated October 20th, 520. The Zechariah 1.1 is November 520. Haggai again... 2.10 and 2.20. December 24th, no connection to our Christmas Eve, 5.20. Zechariah 1.7 is February 24th, 5.19. And then Zechariah 7.1, December 4th, 5.18. So these, these they, inter, they interweave with one another, interlace, interact with one another. Uh, the only difference being that Zechariah uh, is younger. Someone pointed out that Zechariah's prophecy began between Haggai's second and third sermons. So after 14 years of neglect, from 534 to 520, work on the temple was resumed in 520 and was completed in 516. Look at Ezra 615 for some historical background. And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. And so you see how we can date this. It's very precise dating. The Talmud, which is, uh, which is Jewish history uh, external of the scriptures, indicates that the Ark of the Covenant, the Shekinah glory, and the Urim and Thummim were not in the rebuilt temple. They were, they were absent from it. The Ark is lost. They don't anymore experience the descending Shekinah of God. If you want a little more history, uh, Darius I ruled from 521 to 486 B.C. He was the king of Persia during the time that Haggai and Zechariah ministered. Uh, he was the, the ruler who consolidated uh, the Persian kingdom by uh, conquering other nations and defeating a number of nations around him. Well, what is the, what's the theme? Uh, you know, the title of tonight is, is Reconstruction of the Temple. The theme is that the remnant must reorder its priorities and complete the temple before they can expect the blessing of God upon their efforts. You see that? That's an evangelical principle for gospel laborers today. We always need to reevaluate our priorities. Are we putting them, emphasizing gospel priorities if we're going to have the blessing of God? If we get preoccupied with other things, we may feel good about our preoccupation, but we don't necessarily uh, have a guarantee to the blessing of God if we're not ordering and priority of what he says is most important. And so God uses different things to, to arrest their attention, uh, the difficulties they faced within and without, uh, the challenges to, to make a life for themselves again, to, to engage in a livelihood, to sustain themselves from the land. And a Haggai in his messages points out until this changes until attitudes and hearts and emphases change you can't expect the blessing of God it's, it's really if you want one word for it uh, it's self-denial self-denial and when they put God first seek to do his will he will bring his people joy and prosperity not unlike what Jesus says in Matthew 6 33 Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. That is not a health and wealth message. That is a promise that when we make God our priority, he is able to demonstrate his capacity to take care of the other things. So what are some keys? Some keys to, to Haggai. Well, the key word or phrase is reconstruction of the temple. We looked at the verses already. I won't read them again for you. I'll simply cite them where God challenges in chapter 1, verses 7 to 8, go up to the hills, bring the wood, and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it. Please me. 
in other words. That's a challenge, isn't it? Who are we living to please? Please ourselves? Please someone else? God says, please me. Not because he's selfish, but because he knows that if we undertake to please him, that that is the path of blessing and joy. We talked about that this morning. In Haggai 2, 7 to 9. The nations shall come. You focus on what I want you to do. The nations shall come. You're going to hear in Zechariah that the day is coming when ten men will lay hold of the skirts of a Jew and say, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. That's the, that's the picture. And when you do God's work God's way, he, he has the ability to bless. And then the key chapter, of course, is chapter 2. You see this uh, in verses 6 to 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace. And that word peace is, is the key declares the Lord of hosts. Now they were thinking, no doubt when they heard this, that when we finished building the temple, and they certainly had something bigger in mind than what they were building. Their, their thinking was if we build this another grand temple, the nations will simply just bow before us. They will bring their, their treasures to us because we will be the envy. Notice what God does with them. You know, it's going to be a smaller building. You're going to have to find glory somewhere else. Not in the size of your building. You have to find confidence somewhere else. A ground of boasting somewhere else. He humbles them to make them look to him. Follow this. To make him look to him and not to what they have built in his name. But where do you see Jesus uh, in Haggai? Well, certainly where the word peace shows up in chapter 2, verse 9. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace. And he does. He gives the Prince of Peace. Jesus comes, says what? Destroy this temple, and what? Three days I'll raise it up. What's he talking about? Well, we're told in the commentary, he wasn't talking about the temple. He was talking about himself, dying and rising again. He becomes... He becomes the focus of the dwelling of God. He, he is Emmanuel. He is God with us. You don't look to the temple anymore to see the Shekinah glory descending upon the temple. You look to Jesus Christ. And what did John say in his prologue? And we beheld his glory. We gazed upon his glory. When we did that, we discovered that it was the glory. And then the word glory, by the way, doxa in the Greek is the, is the Hebrew equivalent of Shekinah. So you could say, if you want to bring the words over, we beheld his Shekinah. When we did, we realized that it was, it was a manifestation of one uniquely begotten by God the Father. Not full of gold and, and silver, not full of pomp and splendor, not full of grandeur, full of grace and truth. And so, so Jesus is set forth, and someone has suggested that Zerubbabel in this prophecy is a is a type of Christ because he is the line of the line of David which seemed obliterated how could the line of David ever be reestablished well here comes Zerubbabel an offspring of David back into Jerusalem to participate in rebuilding the temple uh, another side note Herod the Great would later spend a fortune on the project of enlarging uh, and enriching this temple. And under Herod's leadership, it was filled with the glory of God incarnate every time Christ came to Jerusalem, when he would come into it, manifest himself there. Well, and I'll just I'm going to cite a verse here about Zerubbabel, chapter 2, verse 23. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you. What's a signet ring? In that day, 
a king had a ring and he would give it to some of his his leaders those who served him and if they had a message from the king they would drop wax on it and stamp the symbol on that ring into it as proof as evidence this is from the king this is a word of authority from the king and Zerubbabel symbolically would be a signet ring he would be representation that God has spoken that God has has given uh, his authority has given his marching orders has given to the people his blessing and so somebody drew this chart if you can put the next that chart up next but he becomes the center of the messianic line and in that sense is like a signet ring sealing both branches together notice Zerubbabel descends from David, but when you trace back the genealogy, he also is from Solomon and from Nathan and Joseph and Mary both represent him in their lineage. So he really is sort of a linchpin in the reestablishing of the glory of God among his people and the, and the intention of God to manifest uh, his pleasure, his will, his word, and his way to his people. Well, finally, what contribution does does Haggai make to the Bible? I said to you earlier, he's one of the few whose, whose challenges brought quick, tangible results. He would be the envy of all the prophets who wanted to see God move. And the envy of modern gospel preachers who want to see God move. 23 days after his first message, People took up again after 14 years of ignoring God's plan. Took up work on the temple. God said in this, in this establishing of the second temple in Haggai 2.19, from this day forward, it says, is, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. When they had reestablished uh, the representation, a, a, a physical symbol of, of God's glory. Now, why? Well, if, you, if you've tracked us with us throughout this whole study, we've talked about from time to time how, how in the Mosaic Law, the sanctuary was central to the whole religious life. Remember, we've told you about this. When they marched in the wilderness... Got to get this picture, this symbol. And the, and the cloud hovering over them moved, whether it was night or day. It was a pillar of fire at night. It was a pillar of a cloud of cover by day. When the cloud stopped, they were to stop. And they marched in a, in a, in a prescribed order. Three tribes to the north, three tribes to the east, three tribes to the west, three tribes to the south. And the Levites in the middle carrying the ark and taking care of the accoutrements. And when the cloud stopped, they stopped. And when they stopped, the Ark of the Covenant was placed down exactly where they stopped. And they built the tabernacle around it every time. Now we read that. I think, well, that was an interesting thing to do. Folks, they did that for 40 years. Their sandals didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. The drapes and the curtains and all the, the fabric that went into the temple didn't wear out in the Sahara Desert. I mean, what, a, what an incredible statement God made over and over. So the centrality of the sanctuary was, was etched into their, their heritage, their journeys. It was where all the offerings, the sacrifices took place, where the priests led out, where worship was undertaken. It was also, one writer said, I thought this was good, it was a symbol of Israel's spiritual identity and a visible reminder to them of God's power, presence, and that he was a near God. He was imminent. And so now that they have seen the destruction of the temple some 50, 60 years before, the throne of David gone, the temple became a focal point for them, a reminder 
God is still for us. God is still with us. It would not be where they would end, but it brought them back to focus. Nothing fancy about Haggai. There's no, you know, when you read it, when we read Ezekiel, the imagery of Ezekiel is just, just astounding. He's not poetic like Isaiah and Nahum, but it's interesting. There's 38 verses in this prophecy. 26 times in those 38 verses, the phrase, thus says the Lord, occurs. It's astounding. 26 times in 38 verses. Thus says the Lord. The, the introduction to what, what I'm about to tell you comes from the sovereign king of heaven and earth, the creator, the sustainer, the lawgiver, the judge. I mean, there, there may not be in terms of the, of the short compact of this prophecy a more thunderingly authoritative prophecy in the Old Testament. And that gives you kind of a summary overview uh, to add to what we, what we watched visually a while ago. So we'll stop there. Any questions or comments or observations?